It's hard to think of many artists who have such affinity for the night in their work, who um, who play with it in so many different ways and who draw such inspiration from it. Were you ever scared of the dark as a child? Uh, not overly, no. I think every now and then things spook us, noises spook us, or sudden unexpected movement can spook us at any age, not necessarily childhood. So, no, I mean, I, I, I found the, always found the night as interesting as the daytime, but not uh, particularly melodramatic or threatening. Uh, I think the thing about the night that interests me is, of course, that you're less reliant on your eyes that primary sort of sense organ of ours and you, you suddenly become aware of other things because you're relying more on smell and uh, your skin temperature, humidity, barometric pressure, gravity, all the fundamental conditioners of life on Earth come into play much more significantly in the way in which we negotiate the environment because we're not, we can't see very much. And that makes the night a very intriguing and seductive and sexy place as well as a potentially threatening place. Do you draw inspiration from that seduction? Do you work better at night? Do I work better at No, I don't think I, I well, I don't, I don't feel as though I work any better at night. There are certain conditions, certain changes that take place though. I mean, most people, most of the world is asleep at night. I'm always, I'm reminded of that wonderful line from Robert Walz's The Balloon Journey, this great sleep slept by millions, you know. From a balloon, this short story describes the sort of, the, um, the earth below at night, is, it has the features of a giant sleeping man, you know. So the thing about it is that there, there are less people around, there's less society, less socialising, and so in a way it's perhaps a more solitary environment uh, at night, and in some respects it becomes more private and perhaps more, there's an intimacy about it. That may open, up, open you up to a greater degree of sensitivity to, to the, the circumstances in which one finds oneself. I understand in your early career before you moved to photography was painting, drawing. Did you did you play with darkness as a as a subject then? Well, I never felt like I played with anything. You know, I, I people have this funny idea about kids playing too. A lot of time, kids are very serious when they're trying to make things or do things. You know, it's incredibly serious business trying to, you know, control a lump of clay or build a billy cart or something. And I never really felt as if I was playing. I always was full of kind of fascination and, you know, a kind of a joy and a contentment and a, you know, impatience and all of that sort of stuff with what I did. But I, I'm, not a, I'm not aware, I don't recall being, you know, more switched on at night than I was during the daytime. I'd say, in fact, it'd be more accurate to sort of say that those periods of transition, dawn and dusk, the transition from night to day or from day to night, would have, would be certainly something I'm I'm more acutely aware of. Something that I kind of you know I stop and I start to notice, you know, the forms changing and the the physical world becoming less visually certain as as our sight, as I said before, diminishes. And so those transitions are probably more significant to me than the night as such. Yeah, I'm interested in your resistance to the idea of play. Do you, do you explore? Do you? Oh no, I, mean, I think I think there is. I mean, you know, that play is a is a profound and, and critical part of life. I mean, I sometimes think of that, um, you know, that thing that we hear in in all great art, historical art, you know, where someone just does something unexpected. It's a form of play. You know, it's a thing you hear in Mozart all the time. You know, it's a thing you can see in the in the brushwork of you know late. Titian or late Rembrandt, you know, they're almost more playful in their old in their old age than they are in their early works. So it's incredibly important, of course. The it seems to me to be also important in terms of finding your way to representation. I mean, the, the, whether it's a landscape or whether it's a body or whatever, mm. surely, surely without play. Um, you're coming to it with preconceived notions. You're not kind of unpicking and well, dancing around. Well, you know, it. I never really worry about it because culture is never outside nature. You know, nature is always a step ahead of us. You know, no matter what we kind of construct for ourselves, whatever crazy intellectual ziggurat we prop prop up, you know, nature is always outside it and around it and through it and under it. So. Um, in a way, thinking about play is not something I do. I think, you know, it's a bit like secondary literature, you know. I mean, it, <laughs> secondary literature is not something I do, you know. Primary literature, you know, I'd rather read the poetry than a, a dissertation on the poetry. And so I don't find myself, you know, following intellectual lines about the nature of play. 
But um, to get back to n the night time or that transition to, to darkness, um, there are so many things about that intimacy that, that I mentioned earlier which are really important, you know. There's a wonderful expression by uh, the German romantic writer Novalis, uh, Friedrich von Hardenberg, um, who said, uh, this is a wonderful thing, he said, the, d the days are distinct but the night has only one name. You know, it's as though when it becomes night time, it goes back to this, this continuum that we're in all the time because we're mostly alone. I mean, we, we may live with people, but in terms of, you know, that we're not in an office and, you know, driving through the traffic, we're more likely to be on our own. And so that solitary journey is reinforced by the night time, I think. And uh, that uh, interests me a lot. I think that's really interesting. I mean, th that divide between nature and culture mm. seems to me that there's an extent to which the night always belongs more to nature than to culture. Well, I think the night, in fact, unites them, brings them closer together. The divisions that we see between, let's say, you know, civilizational logic and in, in, intuitive intelligence or intuitive, um, uh, the intuitive intelligence we have, I think those, those divisions do, do become less obvious, uh, do dissolve into each other. There's a, there's, a, there's a greater uncertainty about so many things. And that, if you like, that ambiguity is, um, is a very, very important thing in the creative process, or it's a, very, it's a very important thing in life generally, but it's particularly important because it's, you know, the best, to my mind, the best, um, how can I put this, the best experience we can have in the presence of any work of art or any creative activity is to go away with more questions than we came. And that depends a lot upon things being sort of uh, not just ambiguous, but to some extent ultimately unknowable. And, and the night... The night and the, the, the disappearance of the, 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 the visible known world helps us move into that area, I think, to some extent. It's not necessarily a melancholy thing either. It is extraordinary, extraordinary to me how many of the poet, great poets were insomniacs, one way or the other. How, how recurring a theme in poetry, yeah. sleeplessness and, and the night without other people around is. Yeah, something. of course, of course, yeah. Do you sleep well? Uh... Well, you know, we, are, we old people sleep less, you know. We need less sleep. I mean, it doesn't matter how often you go to the gym, you just don't seem to need as much sleep. So uh, if you want it on a personal note, you know. But, uh, I re you know, I resist the duties. I don't, I don't like to take chemicals, so... Um, no, best no. not. Just yeah. try that gym instead. Yeah, yeah. Nice glass of wine. <laughs> the, where's your favourite place to be at the dead of night? Um... Well, if, it, it depends on the other great, you know, the, the other great conditioner of life on Earth, which is the weather. It's my old friend Peter Sheldahl called the weather that, you know, most universal conditioner of life on Earth. And, of course, sometimes, you know, we have these magical, um, I don't know, meetings with the world around us on, on hot nights. You know, the night is meant to be cool, the day is meant to be warm. But you know how strange it is on a warm night? And you, it's kind of mad, it seems, un, it seems unnatural to go to bed or to retire for the night because it's so hot outside. And I think times like those kind of unusual circumstances where you find yourself, you know, particularly out of doors, on warm evenings is one of those... That's one of the things that sprang to mind when you said it because it kind of turns things upside down a bit. We feel like we should be up, but it's the middle of the night. Yeah, I think there's something really Australian about that. Mm. It, it feels, you know, it, there's something to me about that kind of uh, nighttime heat that uh, makes me think of Patrick White and the way he wrote about mm. the suburbs as being this kind of buffer between yeah. uh, the kind of Australian wilderness and, and our cities. And yeah. it's well, in I the night that that breaks down. I think, when I think of the night, I also think of, you know, for all the reasons we've already discussed, the sounds, you know, and the sound of the insects, the sound of crickets in the grass, all of this sort of stuff. And we were all much more aware of it. The smell of the grass after a hot day at night is tremendously intoxicating, a very beautiful thing and a very profound thing in, I think, most people's lives if they, re they recall their childhoods and, you know, that cool change that had blow in after days of heat. But at night, somehow, the sort of the ground and, the f and, and, and nature just gives off such an incredible perfume. That sort of thing, which, is, which certainly was so influential for a lot of poets, especially, you know, romantic and symbolist poets, um, is there for all of us all the time, you know. It's just a case of being, being open to it or allowing yourself the space to notice it, you know. Do you resist the reading of your work that has you as a photographer of night? I don't, I don't get involved, you know. The priority of individual experience cannot be overstated, you know. What other people make of it is absolutely fine, you know. I sometimes say to school kids, you know, 
just because I made the picture of a road winding off into a forest, you know, I made the picture, but if it really absorbs your attention, it's, it becomes your road, it's your road, you know. I think it's mad to presume to understand, you know, how else, how can I put this, um, you know, I didn't spend 20 years in your head, how can I presume to understand exactly how the work is affecting you below the obvious levels of recognition of, you know, objects in the picture and things like that so no I'm I love the fact that people have totally different responses and relationships to the work absolutely you're not going to run off and do a series of really brightly saturated photos on Brighton Beach or something though you never know <laughs> Yolana Cantrell you know I mean it's always what's disappearing around the road ahead of you that's most interesting uh, the most interesting pictures for me are always the ones I'm trying to work out in the present, you know, and, and the ones that I can sort of smell but can't quite even understand perhaps what the necessary subject components are, you know, they're the ones that, that exert the pull, they're the, they're the things that, that pull you along through time and, and, you know, once you know what you think you want to photograph through space as well, so, yeah. The, I know you're often inspired in your work by music, the Nocturnes in particular, are you a fan at all or is it not something that you... Oh, look, you know, I mean, I think if you're talking nocturnes, most people think of Chopin and piano music, and of course, you know, as a body of work, they're, they're unbelievable. I mean, you know, um, I think my favourite interpreter of those would be Michelangeli, for those of you who listen to classical music, well, probably, or maybe Claudio Ara, but more likely Michelangeli. Um, is that we're getting the Victoria Police rendition of Chopin's Nocturnes at the moment. It's true, a Melbourne Nocturne. Melbourne Nocturnes. As we uh, said. You know, well, at least we're all safe. You know, it's very important that we're safe. You know, yeah. so, you know, so occupational health and safety is, is, is God, I think, these days. So I, I think it's there to stop us from the hordes of Queenslanders who are making their way down here right yeah, now. Yeah, no, I just think it's up there to try and stop us getting wet. It's probably something like that. That's good. They're very considerate, this new government. I know, I know. They're so thoughtful. I mean, I know. We, we must be careful that, you know, we don't have any dangerous thoughts. <laughs> I'm not, I'm not inclined in that direction. Uh. So, so lastly, because we're coming to the end of our 15 minutes, uh, twilight or mm. evening or dawn? Um, if you're on the edge I think, of night. I think, I think they're the same. They're the same. To me, they're the same. Uh, when you look at images in the history of art, uh, p pictures and paintings and so forth, it's always interesting to try and work out, when it, unless you, if you don't know what the title of it is or what the artist has written, it's always interesting to try and work out whether it's dawn or dusk. It's almost impossible. It's almost impossible. And, uh, I mean, uh, for me, the favourite time... I enjoy... I love morning. I love getting up early in the morning, but um, we're going to be com completely dry, I think, by the time they're finished with this. And, uh, uh, but it doesn't matter in the end. It doesn't matter. You see, the thing is, it's, it, the, the picture, the space becomes what what your imagination puts into it. And the idea is that you, you create, the bigger, the bigger the space and the more charged the gap, the more exciting and, and, and interesting the journey, you know, each person's imagination can, can take in that space. So I have no interest in even sort of, you know, having a title, sunset, dawn, dusk, anything else. I don't want to sort of preempt other people's, I mean, I'm not making the pictures for anyone else, they're only for me, but it just doesn't seem necessary for me to kind of, to um, to label things in that respect, it just it's like untitled because you know number six eight five dash three. That's I, I look. That's I can find the negative again if I even need to print it. You know. I, look, I don't want to be rude, Bill, but every time I say untitled, I think you're being lazy. Yeah, I know, I know. But look, with photography, it's very tricky, you see, because the evidential authority of the medium precedes any individual reading, <laughs> unlike painting and other things. And so, when it's a photograph of a tree and it says tree. You know, I look at that and I think, yes, righto, what's that? And then, of course, when, it, when it's a picture of a tree and it says, you know, the, the journey back to my father's grandparents or something, and it's a picture of a tree, it's like, you know, uh, it, it, for some people, t in some cases, titles are great and they add to the visual power and the suggestive potential of the work. Other times, they just are unnecessary or superfluous. But I think it's down to individuals, that, you know, to if someone needs to title their works, if someone needs to make smart pictures of the suburbs and call them hypermart intersection, they can do it. You know, but I just never felt it was necessary. And as um, Federico Fellini once said, sometimes the most outlandish things are necessary. And perhaps just calling everything untitled is outlandish, but uh, it just doesn't seem necessary for me. So, 
Good answer. Clearly been called lazy before. Bill, I'm going Absolutely. to... Absolutely. I'm, I'm going to ask you to move to this chair to interview Sophia Bruce. I'm okay. going to hover uh, at that microphone there just to be irritating and talk over the uh, yep. helicopter if an opportunity arises. Okay. But a big round of applause for Bill Henson. Thank you.